Wonderful. Why don't you stand with me one more time before we get into the text today, and uh, we're going to read this passage together. Actually, now, well, I'll read it to you. Uh, we sometimes read it out loud together, but we're going to look at First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter 12 today, and uh, pretty famous passage. And uh, as we enter into Lent, I think it's kind of interesting and serendipitous, or maybe even a work of the Holy Spirit, that this passage is our, what we are going through the first Sunday in Lent as we wrestle with repentance in this season and the idea of turning and our sinfulness, both as individuals and in society at large, structural sin, personal sin, and then that sense of Christ entering into and redeeming and restoring original blessedness. So this is a fascinating passage to start this, the season of Lent, the Sundays leading up before Easter. So go ahead with me, uh, read along on the screen, I'll read it out loud together. I'm reading from the New English translation today. So Paul says this, to the church at Corinth, probably his third letter to them, he says, it is, it is necessary to go on boasting, though it is not profitable. <laughs> It is necessary, but it's not profitable, but here I go anyway. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into the third heaven. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, he was caught up into paradise and heard things too sacred to be put into words, things that a person is not permitted to speak. Verse 5, on behalf of such an individual, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except about my weaknesses. For even if I wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be telling the truth, but I refrain from this so that no one may regard me beyond what he sees in me or what he hears from me. 7, even because of the extraordinary character of the revelations. Therefore, so that I would not become arrogant, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to trouble me, so that I would not become arrogant. And I asked the Lord three times about this, that it would depart from me. But he said to me, my grace is enough for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, And I'm going to read that one more time because that's a pretty crucial uh, uh, crux of this whole thing. But he said to me, my grace is enough for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So then, so then I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may reside in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with troubles, with persecutions and difficulties for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. So, Lord, we come to you today and we wrestle with this ancient text. We wrestle with what it meant in Paul's Greco-Roman Jewish context, what it means and might mean for us today. As we do the work of soaking in Scripture and interpreting as we always do, please, please be with us today. And I pray that there would be some light of the Holy Spirit illuminating this for each person in this room today, that, Lord, you'd have something for them to hear, and as a community as well, that it's not just us as isolated persons, but we are a people together, an alternative city within the city for the blessing of the world. So be with us today. Do your work, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And if you're willing to say amen or amen, you can be seated today. Weakness as power. Pain as healing, struggle as freedom. Our world is often driven by games of power, whether through numbers or through our way we tell our stories. But we're told here that there's a different kind of power that we do not control. It's given to us as a countercultural example of embracing limits and experiencing this different kind of power. And it is at our limits where the potential, I believe, that we see in this kind of teaching, uh, uh, the potential for real joy can happen, real encouragement and sustainable living lies when we actually embrace the power, not simply in our acquired skills and talents, but also the power, the power from below of weaknesses. And this is one of the wonderful things about this kind of Jesus-centered Christianity. It tells us something, that there is power in the cross 
And the power of the cross is a power so different than most ways we experience power in the world. The power that God unmasks those things that try to oppress and destroy us and the creatures of God. There's a different power at work, and we want to lean into this today as we look at Paul's uh, teaching. In 2 Corinthians, there were, of course, those uh, teachers that came in after he helped get the church and planted the church that wanted to say, no, 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 our cultural models of power over and of eloquence and of beauty, they are more important. In fact, Jesus is not enough. You need to have these things as well. You need to, to get in line with whatever these values are. And Paul says, no, in fact, these things are leading you away from the simple message of who Jesus is and that Jesus is, he is the fullness of truth and life and peace. And so he's coming back and writing and trying to correct. And for the most part, this church has turned back towards the original apostolic teaching he gave. But there's still some issues with people trying to pull it off the Jesus center because they had their pet issues. And they wanted to make them uh, as important or maybe more important than Jesus. And yet here's the thing, the thing that sustains the church for the generations, the thing that sustains the little O Orthodox church is the story and person of Jesus, is Jesus making himself known through the outrageous love that he displays. And that is what continues to change people's lives. But when we begin to go off and create other forms, it, be, it takes us away from the very power of what it means to be a follower of Christ, his life, teachings, death, and resurrection. And so Paul continues in this passage to his defense against the character attack. Remember, he was uh, these, these other teachers or false teachers were probably within the, the, the school of the sophist, a certain kind of rhetoric, a certain kind of performative speech making, and also dealing with how he undermined different cultural values intentionally to get them to move towards Christ. And so this, this is what he's dealing with here. And so he continues, he's boasting, but he's boasting in a way that talks about his weakness. He is shaming himself in their cultural values. He is putting himself in the one down or more position lower than what they considered was proper for someone in his station and with what he was doing. And so he continually, in these last two chapters, uh, is just, just going again and again, and it's called the fool's speech. He's being a holy fool. He's demonstrated absurdity by being absurd. And in fact, he even says in the last passage that this is not even the ideal way to communicate, but because they are so far caught up into their values of what esteem and privilege and power should look like, he is intentionally using, and he's displaying, by the way, contrary to their attack, he's a pretty amazing rhetorician in his writing as well and how he's weaving this together, but he is also exposing it and he's putting himself in that place. In some ways, he is doing what God always does. God enters into our mess, takes it on to expose it, and then show us the way out and forward. And so he's doing that with them. He ended chapter 11 with uh, sort of the ultimate shaming and uh, sort of turning the values of the culture on its head by uh, instead of storming the city walls and receiving the corona moralis, the crown of the wall, the ultimate Roman military, one of the big Roman military honors, he shows that he's the opposite. He is the corona Christi or the, or the crown of Christ. He uh, goes out the city wall to escape, to uh, live for another day for the kingdom of God. So very interesting in how he just completely uses himself as sort of the counter example and exposing all of this stuff as false false honor, and that true honor lies in who Christ is and God's outrageous love in him. Okay, so now he appeals to his mystical experiences. The false teachers also, we are pretty sure, I mean, they had some version of Christianity. Obviously, they came to faith, they were involved in the church, and they were very engaged in the charismatic gifts as well. And in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, he talks a lot about the charismatic gifts. And they were using the charismatic gifts as markers, status markers in the body of Christ. Well, I have the supernatural gift of, well, we just talked about the policy committee. Not only am I a good uh, tactician and policymaker, I have a supernatural chrism of creating policies. I can just like speak them forth and they just, the paper fills up. Uh, some had this charismatic gift of speaking in tongues. Some walked with healing. Some, uh, all of the prophetic uh, words for people to build up and encourage. And, and they were saying, because I have these gifts... You need to respect this leadership more, that the charisma is the thing that is the emphasis. And so Paul corrects this. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, he says this, I speak in tongues more than all y'all, uh, Greek plural, more than all of the, you, you, you all, and, uh, I, and all of that, and, and I prophesy, and all of a sudden, and yet he said, in order to build the church up, I'm going to submit those things to what the church needs. And he said, I would that you all prophesy, uh, that you would have a word to console, to build up, to encourage. 
Because it's easy to have a word, uh, you know, to spout something out in, in, a, in a, an ecstatic speech. It's easy to give a denunciation prophetic word. It's hard to be consistent in saying, Holy Spirit, empower me for what builds up, what consoles, what brings about your love in the church. Because that brings healing and that brings true holiness. And so he's dealing with all this. And now he's saying they, have, they claimed mystical visions. How many of you remember the book a few years ago? about the guy, uh, the boy that went to heaven. Any of you remember this? Like, it was big in evangelical circles, the boy who went to heaven. Turns out it was a fraud and was manipulated later. But this is the kind of thing that Paul is dealing with too. Because he could say, he could begin to say, well, let's compare mystical experiences. And so they are saying, well, we've had these experiences. We, we've had these, you know, we've, we've achieved this wisdom through our spiritual encounters, and therefore you all need to submit more to these false teachers. So Paul here does something really powerful about spiritual experience. So he says, let's just review verses 1 through 4 in the outline, snatched up into paradise into the third heaven. And by the way, in the Jewish context of the time, there was different teachings around the nature of different levels of heaven. Don't get too hung up on that. But the idea here is that whatever that sense of being in the presence of God, that's how he's using this third heaven language. Like he's in the presence of God. He's, he's experiencing God in some way, shape, or form in a very direct way in his experience. But he says this, it's necessary to go on boasting, though it's not profitable. <laughs> I, I love these leadership lessons here. Sometimes in leadership, you've got to make decisions that you're just, you'll lose if you do, you'll lose if you don't. And here he says, I'm going to do this to deal with the nonsense that's going on with some of these folks. He says, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Visions, generally something that you see, whether it's something where you, in case you're, you, you feel that you're literally physically experiencing something that is not in your normal uh, life, a vision there, or it could be something that happens in your holy imagination, but it's visually oriented, hence the word vision. Uh, so all visions fall under the category of revelations, uh, something being revealed to you supernaturally through an experience of God, um, but it's a subcategory, and revelation is just a bigger category. You can have a revelation that may come in some other form, not necessarily a vision. Okay, that's a little charismatic geek out there if you're not super familiar with those terms, but they're, I think in this case, and most of the biblical scholars say he's trying to overlap the two concepts. He's having a unique encounter, a spiritual experience, and he says this again, uh, he doesn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body. Like this experience was so profound, like he couldn't tell if it was physically being relocated, which there are stories of that in the scriptures, or if it's happening in his holy imagination, he couldn't tell the difference. Like that's a pretty powerful thing if you really don't know, was I physically there or was it something I encountered in the spirit engaging my mind? I don't, I don't know, I can't tell the difference. So, so this is a pretty powerful experience he's trying to relay. And he speaks about himself initially in the first few verses of the chapter in the, in the third person, but then we find out in verse 6 and 7, he's actually talking about himself. Now, that's kind of weird to us in like modern English usage, but it was a way of conveying humility and awe. Like he, he couldn't even name himself in the story initially as he's trying to express it to them, and then he switches to reveal to us, oh, by the way, I'm talking about myself later on. So don't, don't let that get you caught up either, but that's some of the language here. So I want to share a little more about this. Um, how are you guys doing today? Are, you, uh, are we awake? Are we, are we getting there? Yeah. I'm okay. Uh, Harry's not here this morning. Are you having fun? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> the young, young definition of fun is you're not six feet below the ground. So are you having fun? All right. No, no. Okay. Yes, you are. You are. You're alive. You're awake. Good. So let's review a few things here uh, before we move into the rest of the passage. And again, it's just 10 quick verses so the first thing he tells us, you know, the boasting in verse 1 uh, it doesn't profit, uh, brings the profit that matters, but he's compelled to deal with the attacks, as we've already said. And um, apparently, this comparison of the charismatic gifts, like I said, has been a problem. And so people are claiming authority based on spiritual gifts, but Paul hammers in 1 Corinthians, when he's first dealing with the, the chaos in this church, he hammers that the charismatic gifts are absolutely to be welcome in public worship. Uh, which may be a shock to most North American uh, evangelicals and mainliners, but the rest of the world doesn't have nearly a bigger problem as we do about this. So there's a space for these gifts to be in operation. In fact, we put it on the screen almost every Sunday. To each one, he said in 1 Corinthians, uh, to each one, the manifestation, meaning making God real through your holy imagination and using your words and your actions, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is for the common good, meaning for the purpose of the community. It's not just about you in your prayer closet or at home. I do all that too, but there's a place and there should be a space for the gifts. 
But the gifts have been co-opted because in Corinth, the pagan spiritualities also had spiritual gifts. There also was speaking in tongues, a pagan version of it. There also were healings and going to the temple to get prophecies. There was a non-Christian version of all of this as well. So their church was very open. Unlike most of us in, in uh, North American church context, they were the exact opposite. So culturally, it was actually way more acceptable to have you know, uh, Sister Brunella going off in tongues in a worship gathering in the pagan temple. Well, you know, whatever. I mean, all of that was common in their culture. Very different than what most of us experience in our context here in these churches today. So he's bringing correction, sort of overcorrecting there, and also dealing with the spiritual or the, uh, the adversarial teachers as well that were using those as status markers in the local church as well. So he's trying to correct several things there. So again, here he talks about this uh, experience he has caught up in a paradise. He wants the church to understand that these experiences are good and normal part of Christian life. But here's the big uh, issue here. They are not qualifications for leadership. They are baseline things to welcome in the church, but they are not status markers, nor do they uh, sort of circumvent other qualifications for leadership, which absolutely matter in the local church. What is the other qualification that matters more than charismatic gifts? Quite simply, it's character. It's character. It's the long march of, is this person growing in love? Is this person growing in someone in the fruit of the Spirit in their life? How is that being demonstrated? And so Paul says to them, in his letters in Acts, Luke writes that Paul received many visions and revelations, and yet Paul never recounts the details of his spiritual experiences in his letters. That's fascinating. What was common was to publish books. Uh, you know, my, my journey to heaven, my, the apocryphal, all these apocryphal, 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 blah, 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 apocryphal, that was not tongues, that was just me making noise, uh, apocryphal. <laughs> Uh, letters in ancient Judaism within the Greco-Roman world as well. It was popular to, to publish the books, The Boy Who Went to Heaven, The Man Who Went to Hell, the, the 90 Seconds in Hell. I forget, there was a whole slew of them that came out some years ago. You know, 90 Seconds in Hell, 90 Seconds you know, in Utah, 90 Seconds in Heaven, 90 Seconds here, like all this stuff. And Paul is literally condemning that stuff in that he's saying he relays, he says, I had an experience and then he refuses to publish the memoir. He refuses to capitalize on it. And he's saying, in fact, the people that are doing that are being counter to Christ because they're drawing you away from the simplicity and the beauty of Jesus at the center. They're trying to get you to peg your faith on their experiences. And he talks about demonstration of the spirit and power, but he says very specifically that the, the, the authentic test of the charismatic gifts, if it's of God or not, is does it move you closer to Jesus? If it's not helping you move your error to Jesus, I don't care how wonderful, how many tingles up and down your spine you get or you, or you are caught up in the body or out. That's what he's saying. The ultimate test is, does it move you closer to Jesus for your character becoming more like him? And at the same time, he's saying we should welcome all those things because God does work in them. But here's the problem. And their leadership is saying, well, we've had these visions and we had these dreams and we've published the book, 90 Seconds in Hell, 90 Seconds in South Dakota, 90 Seconds in Canada, 90 Seconds in Heaven. You know, the boy that went to heaven, the boy that came back, the boy that lied about going to heaven and the sequel, you know, keep, my goodness, saints, don't be so gullible. Don't keep buying that garbage. Here we have straight up here. You do not build your faith on that. But if you have a personal encounter of the Holy Spirit in a gathered community, where we're submitted to one another in mutuality, we can test one another. There's not some fly-by-night prophet coming through, you know, trying to bedazzle everyone and wow them. This idea that we, we can test those words then. And the ultimate test is, is it moving me towards becoming more like Jesus? That's the test. And apparently that's not what's been going on with the gifts there. So we could unpack more about the apocalyptic vision. Uh, again, it was very heaven, this, or this idea of third, third heaven, this highest realm. Paul's using common Jewish language in the day from a lot of the 90 seconds in heaven, 40 seconds in hell, 60 seconds in South Dakota books. Uh, so he's using that kind of thing uh, as well to, to kind of cue them in that this was a pretty powerful experience he had. Judith Deal, biblical scholar, says this. She says, the Holy Spirit is the initial mark of a Christian believer. And the filling of the Spirit in a converted person has discernible effects. And so Paul speaks about the work of the Spirit. The Spirit draws us forward. I am still a Christian because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes those experiences in my life, they are important. But again, it can become distorted when we begin to create first class and second class, class Christians, when we begin to use that as a qualification for leadership. The qualifications that matter are the character of Christ. Those matter and trajectory and movement towards Christ-likeness. 
Okay. Whew, I said a lot there. I better be quiet and drink some coffee. Look to your neighbor and check in with them. Make sure they're okay, still alive, all right? All right. It's the snow. I did, all the, did a bunch of shoveling this morning. I must just have my heart rate still up, so I got to, you know, <laughs> chill out. All right. So let's get to the five through six before we get to the last uh, few verses. So the middle section. He said, on behalf of such an individual, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except about my weaknesses. Even if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool. So he's going on, just kind of telling us, yeah, and then he begins to shift and let us know, oh, by the way, um, I'm playing this game with these folks, uh, but I have other stuff. So I'm not going to boast in the spiritual experience, but rather the parts of my life that you all can verify. And this I love, verse 6. He said, for even if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I would be telling the truth. But I will refrain from this so that no one re- may regard me beyond what he sees in me or what he hears from me. Now, this is crucial here before we get to the other big verse, verse 9. So what he's saying is what matters in my leadership, in my character, is what you can verify. You see, I can have a vision and I can say, well, I could write a book. I could, I could say, you know, my son, when he was three, he, he, had a, he, he died and, and he went into heaven. And I, and I can begin to manipulate this and I could begin to publish this. But you can't verify that, can you? That's not a verifiable experience. You can't join me in that unique experience. I'm joking because that's what the boy that went to heaven. It was basically fabricated by his parents. Um, and uh, you can't verify that. You're taking them all on trust. But you know what you can verify? Not entirely. Like you can't see someone's heart. But you can see their behavior patterns. You can see how they act towards you. You can determine, is this person uh, uh, demonstrating the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all the gifts? Is there some evidence of that? You can see some of that. And so Paul says, you know what? As a leader, I'm not going to sit there and try to say, I deserve to speak into your life because of all my spiritual experiences, but rather based on the character that you see. And he continues to talk about the kind of character is which is opposite of many of the world's values in the ancient world and many of ours today as well. And he says, those speak to the truthfulness, the veracity of who I am and who it is I'm calling you to consider in Jesus. That's important to know. So I'm going to refrain from boasting about my experiences, but... I will talk about that, which you can see and what you've heard from me. That's powerful stuff right there. That preaches. I wish the church I grew up in talked more about that verse 6 there. Um, Moyer Hubbard says this about this passage. Paul understands that religious charlatans, like the intruders in the church at Corinth, use grandiose spiritual claims as a substitute for character. And his implicit appeal is consider their life and conduct, not their unsubstantiated boasts. Look at what they're doing and the effect they have on the church. All right, let's, let's land this thing in the last few verses. Verse 7 through 9, he says, Because of the extraordinary character of the revelations, being caught up into the third heaven, therefore I, so that I would not become arrogant. Now this is crazy stuff. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to trouble me, so that I would not become arrogant. I asked, the Lord three times about this, that it would depart from me. I can just imagine Paul, the charismatic Paul, praying, Father, deliver me from this, whatever it is, this thorn. Lord, take the thorn away. Lord, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Uh, You know, he probably got the anointing oil out. He probably had the prayer team going, man. He had had like the ancient world uh, chain of uh, whatever, whatever it was. Lord, deal with this thing, you know, whatever. And I can just imagine, like when he says he asked the Lord three times, I think this is serious intercession. And then he got an answer, but he said to me, my grace is enough for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So then, Paul says, I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may reside in me. These little verses right here will mess with a whole bunch of triumphalist power over theology. This stuff right here is telling us something about what it means to be cross-centered and cross-shaped. This right here is stuff that will blow up anybody who comes in with overwhelming, oh, I'm, I'm such a, a worm, I'm, I'm, I, there's no belovedness in me, or, or look at me, I'm walking in victory, hallelujah, you know, the demons, everything's fine in my life, look at this, you know, uh, it will mess with both of those things. And say, in fact, you are on pro- in process until the life of the world to come. Every one of us is on a journey with Jesus, hopefully, if we're claiming him anyway. 
And even if we're not claiming him, we're on a journey with Jesus, you just don't know it yet. And we hope you can take those steps and begin to say, hey, you know what? This God revealed scandalously, particularly of outrageous love, letting us kill him on the cross. Wow. I mean, there's power in this. And so he describes a challenge. Maybe he was tempted. Maybe I'm going to write the book. Should I write the book? If I write the book, I can write a new apocrypha, the apocryphal book of Paul. And if I write the book, I can monetize that thing. I can sell that thing. I can go to, to, go to believers that, are, that desperately need a touch from Jesus. And instead of that, I can sell them my book. That's the problem, by the way, one of them in the church when we get caught up in this stuff. Instead of the thing that actually brings freedom, we sell a, 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 you know, a porridge of these things. And he says, but in fact... I didn't do that because I had this other thing going on in my life that kept me from becoming arrogant enough to think that I could publish a better word than the living word, Jesus. And he said, I prayed three times and the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. So there's lots of speculation about what is the thorn? What is the thorn? What do you think the thorn is? Anyone want to venture a guess today? I mean, some of you have been in church a long time. Have you heard different stories? What's the thorn? The thorn is humility? Okay. Okay. Well, anyone else? Well, take a guess. What's the thorn? The thorn in Paul's flesh. What do you think? Go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. You're a disability. Yeah. Anyone else want to venture a guess? What's the thorn? The thorn in his flesh. Any, have you heard anything else? Any other stories about the thorn? Well, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> and that's probably intentional on Paul's part, and it is intentional. There is evidence that it might have been a physical disability because he does talk about his issues with his own physical struggling, um, but it could be anything. It could be a temptation. It could be a person. Uh, it could be, you know, I mean, he wasn't praying about his, his, his wife or something like that. Isn't that sort of my, I'm just kidding. That was a bad marriage joke. Okay. All right. It wasn't a person. It could have been a person. It could have been a, a physical malady. We know he had uh, issues with his eyes in Galatians at one point, I think in chapter four, he says, see, now I'm writing with my own hand how big the letters are. Normally someone like him would have a scribe and they would, he would talk and they would write it down, sort of like voice to text in the ancient world. Um, so it may have been that, but we ultimately don't know. In my flesh leans towards a physical condition and Galatians 4.13 would sort of support that. But who knows? It could have been the opposition he experienced. It could have been temptations. It could have been guilt over past sin. It could have been headaches, depression, vision issues, epilepsy have all been suggested. But it was painful in some way. Psychologically, physically, it was painful. It weakened him and it was chronic. It made work, travel, and ministry difficult, but did not totally knock him out of it. And it's likely that the Corinthians knew what it was. And that some looked down on him for that. We see that in chapter 10, for example, that Paul, today we might say he was differently abled. Perhaps that's what's going on. And in that context, it would have been a, a pretty uh, mark against him in how the ancient world viewed these kinds of things. So here's what I want to say about this before... Oh, I'm, how am I doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. Okay, all right. Um, we started late. It's snow day. You're here. We're in this together. You know, let's enjoy the moment, right? <laughs> Suffering matters. That... Even though I would argue that suffering is not God's will, and it's not God's primary will or desire, God can use the brokenness of suffering in order to bring out some good. Now, that's not to say all suffering is God-blessed. Don't, don't misunderstand. I mean, this, I'm trying to parse something here. I don't think it's God's intention that, I mean, it says in Scripture, death is the final enemy that is defeated in Christ and will be defeated one day. Uh, so I think we need to be careful that we don't say, we don't seek out suffering, per se, we don't intentionally go about that. But when we experience suffering, God may be at work in that. But Paul's first response was not to assume that God was at work, not to assume suffering as a gift. I think that's where we get into problems, uh, where we can get into some weird theology there. But so he prays to have it removed. That's proper. I think when you're experiencing some form of evil, temptation, suffering, sin, the right response initially is to say, Lord, deliver us, deliver me, work through it. You know, however, physical healing, medical healing, supernatural healing, therapy, whatever you need to do, seek the healing. But if not total healing comes, you may get the word from God, this sort of word that he does get saying that, well, maybe this thing is being used to move something in you to a deeper, more Christ-centered life. Now, practically speaking in the local church, that means we need to chill out on some of our full false holiness terrors that we can get on, on others and judgment seats that we can easily plop ourselves on top of, right? Because maybe the thing that that person is going through, dealing with, struggling with in their body, mind, or spirit, 
Maybe they have wrestled with the Lord, and maybe the healing of that thing will not happen until God comes again in the new creation, the new Jerusalem, and the old earth come together as one. Maybe some things in our lives are there to draw us closer to Jesus, and that should mean that we are more grace-filled, more merciful, more loving, because the path to holiness is not complete until the trumpet sounds and the Lord descends, and he says, behold, all things are new. But until that day, we live in between. And this is my problem with a lot of us evangelicals is that we can get way caught up in libertinism or uh, anything goes on one hand, not naming suffering as suffering, not naming sin as sin, or more often is the case, we jump on the judgment seat of God, we kick the father off the throne, tell Jesus to get off the side, I'm plopping myself down and forget that, oh, by the way, you're also a sinner in process too. You are a saint and sinner, you are beloved And also dealing with this brokenness at the same time. And to be in denial about that creates a lot of problems. And I think progressives, conservatives, uh, this false false, uh, dualism, we have to get beyond if we're going to walk more faithfully in following Jesus and be a redemptive, life-saving community. Um, Wow. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. Um, But this passage just speaks strong to that. Paul talks about this elsewhere in Philippians 3. He says, but whatever gain I had, whatever holiness I had, whatever cultural cachet I had, I count for loss for the sake of Christ. He said, I count for loss everything because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. If it's Jesus-centered, it's about knowing Jesus and growing in Jesus versus focusing on being bounded. It's focused on the center. And he said, I count all of my former boundedness where I was on the right side of the line. He said this, I, have, I want to know Jesus. That's what I want to know. For his sake, I've endured, suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law-keeping and bounded thinking, but that which comes through faith in a living relationship with the Lord of the universe in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that, God, that is from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and be found and find the power of his resurrection and I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death with whatever he's struggling with in his weaknesses, that by any means possible, he says, verse 11, I may attain the resurrection from the dead, the ultimate triumph over all sin, all injustice, all brokenness in my body and the universe. That is the resurrection from the dead. I want that. I will not settle for anything less. So while we do not choose suffering or sin or cause it, we have to ask, how do we work through this? And are we bringing it before the Lord and are we creating space for people to heal and to experience divine love? That is how people come into the kingdom of God. Suffering can open us up to the radical, enchanted ministry of the Holy Spirit, the beautiful kingdom of God that is birthed through spiritual warfare in our lives, the power of the kingdom. Okay, I got I to gotta get to the end here. And everyone said amen. Whew. All right, it's good stuff. If you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, this will bring freedom and empowerment for you. I asked the Lord three times and he said no. A messenger from Satan. God did not deliver him from the messenger from Satan. Think about that. But he's going to give him grace to walk with that, whatever it is, to the end of his life until the complete healing of the kingdom comes. Can we be a church where we have people that are like Paul? That was really the issue with part of the church at Corinth. Some of them said, no, absolutely not. Paul planted it. Paul got them centered on Jesus. Like, think about the arrogance of those people in that church that he had to deal with, the false leaders. That most had turned back, though. Most had, they saw this and they said, yeah, you know what? I was captivated by Jesus. I need to return to my first love because all this bounded stuff is not love. But this other, this first love, I, I'm returned, but not quite all. So he's still dealing with it. And so he gets to the very end here, therefore, therefore, old time Pentecostal preachers would say, whenever you see a therefore in the text, you need to ask, what is it there for? <laughs> therefore, in conclusion, in sum, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with troubles, with persecutions and difficulties for the sake of what's staying centered on Jesus, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Old timers would say that preaches. Indeed, it preaches. God's power, N.T. Wright says this, God's power and human power are not only not the same thing, often the second human power has to be knocked out 
of the way altogether for the first to shine through as God desires and intends. So Paul says, I will boast about my weakness. I will have pride in my weakness. And when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Say it with me. When I am weak. When I am weak. And he applies it to suffering, hardship, persecution, endured on the behalf of keeping Jesus at the center of church. And it is precisely through his troubles, with his real body versus his ideal body one day, that the presence and power of Jesus is mediated more perfectly to the world. It is in his uniqueness, his strangeness, admitting it is sinful and broken and a messenger from Satan that allows him to be one of the most of blessing to others. He names something as evil and that he's still wrestling and dealing with it. That kind of humility is not seen in many places in Christianity. And this is the problem of being co-opted spiritually by this left or right thinking. And I'm not talking about a both sideism here, but there actually is a third way that Paul points out here that is powerful and delivering. Can we be people radically focused on Jesus? God's power and human power, one more time, are not only not the same thing, often the second human power has to be knocked out of the way altogether for the first to shine through as God desires and intends. I'm going to invite um, uh, Joshua and Kaysen to come up here, and I'm going to just share the last few things, and then we'll move into communion. And then I have a special uh, statement I'm going to share at the close of all of this. So if you need to escape, escape, but you'll miss all the exciting stuff at the very end. How is that for manipulation? That's horrible. Uh, it's just how. I can't, we can't do everything at once, right? Um, so post-trip, as we land this plane, as we pull the car into the driveway, as we prepare to depart for the rest of our week after having this experience together where the Spirit is present, charismatic number one, I will say, charismatic experiences can change our lives, but we do not use them to manipulate others, to claim leadership over. Character trumps the charismatic. Say it with me. Character trumps the charismatic. One more time. Character trumps the charismatic. True charismatic experience, mystical experience, grows us. But it is not an automatic, be, be careful when people are using that to brush aside character and other accountability in their lives. So that's important to know. I don't know how many things I grew up around. We had the fly-by-night prophets. They'd have words for people in the room and all this. And oh, it was so exciting. People, you know, coming up for prayer and, you know, physical being pushed over. People like all kinds of, some of that was genuine, but some of it was a bunch of nonsense. And the genuine stuff changes people's life and the nonsense pushes people away. So being discerning about the work of the Spirit is important. And if leaders use that to be unaccountable, that's a whole nother abuse of power, abuse of God's power. Now they're taking power experiences that people have, and then they're will weaving human power into it and being abusive with it. That Paul utterly condemns here. Second thing is, uh, oh, and underneath that point, charismatic experiences can change our lives. If someone is selling a bunch of books based on their mystical experiences, be very, very, very cautious about that. Because that's the stuff that Paul, in fact, says he will not do. That's powerful right there. Secondly, sin and sickness can be turned by God to make you a better person, a better leader, while still not being his will. Think about that. The foolish things, the weak things, the lowly things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, so that no one may boast. So sometimes that stuff, and when you see people wrestling and they're not where you want them to be, keep in mind that if, how you disciple someone in that is about, let's, let's talk about, is our arrow of our life being wrestling with Jesus and the different identities we hold together, are we pointing them towards Jesus? Are we letting Jesus speak into it? Because we can really quickly, well, as James says, those that don't show mercy will receive no mercy. Therefore, mercy triumphs over judgments. Uh, James chapter 3 talks about, or 2.13. So we have to be careful because we're real quick, especially in Baptist. I'm from Baptist Pentecostal land, mostly Anabaptist and a little Eastern Orthodox adjacent. But there's a lot of folks within our camps that are more than willing to like just say, hey, there you go, Jesus, get off the throne. i got to say something. Those that do not show mercy will not receive mercy. That is taught by Jesus. It is reiterated by James, by Peter, and Paul. Because what you do is you remove the conditions for true holiness and you replace it with false external bounded holiness versus what changes the heart. That is condemned again and again. And say, don't do that, don't be that. Because you'll be the one that goes before judgment day thinking you have the list all ticked and you forgot. It's never been about a list. It's been about the character and the person of Jesus. And I don't want to be there on judgment day and have the Lord say to me, well, Shell, you did a real good job of creating a lot of false holiness disciples. The problem is not one of them loves me. And instead of, well done, thou good and faithful servants, he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. 
I never knew you. That's a relational language, by the way. It trumps the legal model. That's another sermon. I'm out of time. I better stop. Finally, prayer can be answered with a no. Yes, we pray when we think what we're experiencing is, he, is, is evil, sinful, temptation, whatever, not God's will. But some, we need to be silent as well. Paul prayed three times, and I think he genuinely prayed. If he said he prayed three times, I believe this brother prayed three times based on all the things we know about his character. But he heard a no. I'm not going to take the messenger from Satan away because, in fact, I'm going to use what the enemy intended for evil to bring out a greater good through you for the sake of my gospel to spread. Whew. We want something more simple sometimes. That is not a simple answer, Lord. No, I'm going to let death and sin live and mess with you in order to make you more alive and bring you through the other side and bring more people along into this Jesus-centered way. Wow, that's powerful stuff. That will mess with you. You should leave this meditating, read through this passage again. Ask the Lord to speak to you on this because there will things the Holy Spirit will say, you know what, this thing you need to let go of or you need to live in tension with it. This you will live in tension with, but I'm going to make you more and more like the kind of person I wanted you to be and want you to be. Wow, what a word from the Lord. That's powerful stuff. It also makes me cool my jets on wanting to kick Jesus off the judgment seat and put myself there in front of other people's lives. Because I don't know, I may not be privy to that conversation. Paul's letting us in on his, but most people we won't be privy to that conversation. So the church needs to be a safe place for people in various places on their journey. This is not Pastor Shell. This is not North American Baptist theology or any particular subgroup of Christians. This is from the New Testament letters. This is from the second letter to the Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. This is one person who most of us and our ancestors would not be in the kingdom of God if it weren't for Paul's call to the Gentiles. This is from Paul via the Holy Spirit's inspiration. This indeed is the word of the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning? And as you do so, say thanks be to God. <laughs> and if this does not convict you wherever you're at on the spectrum, I pray that you, the Holy Spirit, would soften your heart and open your mind to what the word is saying here today because this is a hard word. It's hard for me to preach this and hear this because I can name times when I've been so far off. Oh, but Lord, thank you for your grace. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your mercy. Lord, thank you for the beauty we've even seen in the Asbury Revival where there was not about a charismatic personality type. It wasn't about all the a shiny show, but just about some humility and people coming before you. And Lord, I confess that oftentimes I want to put myself on the judgment seat whether from my conservative judgments or my progressive judgments or, or some version in between. Lord, I don't want to be there, but the temptation is strong. Lord, help me to be like Paul. Help us to be like Paul who says that we will boast in our weaknesses. We're not putting on the judge robe and the judge wig. We're, not, we're taking all that off and we're getting off of that seat. We're letting you sit on that seat. And Lord, thank you that it's not over till you say it's over and that you work and you strive with humans until the day comes when you make all things new because love was worth the risk. And so, God, I pray for deliverance and healing in this house. I pray, God, even today that people would have a new awakening of what does the word say about our relationship with you, with one another, with ourselves, with our struggles. And Lord, that yes, we name things as broken, but even sometimes in those states, that brokenness remains to reveal the deeper blessing of healing and health that you are trying to work in our minds and bodies. Help us to learn this tension. Help us to hold on to it because it keeps us in a posture of moving towards you and receptivity to the work of your spirit. Help us to avoid the narratives of false holiness and false healing. We want the real thing. We don't want a cheap knockoff that we manufacture or produce. We want the thing that can only come as sheer gift from you, Jesus, and your cross. And Lord, for the person today that may, need to t may, may feel the call to begin to orient their life towards you, to begin that process of saying yes to you, Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give them what they need to take that next step. 
and that you would come and dwell in them by your spirit and they would begin that lifelong conversation of transformation and being restored fully in the blessedness that they have been created with. For the enemy is a liar. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes as an angel of light. But you, O oh Jesus, you have come that we might have life and have it full, abundant. And you say, whosoever will, whosoever will. The table is spread. Come and receive. And so we want to receive from you today. In Jesus' name, amen.